Hallelujah. So week six, we're in the body of Christ, the apostolic and prophetic. Everyone's got their notes. Excellent. Homework reading. Now we're, we're amping up our homework reading because we're coming to the home stretch. So that's Isaiah 48 to 53. Okay, so we're extending our reading. And uh, we want to get right to the end of Isaiah by the end of this unit. Isaiah 48 to 53. Hallelujah. God is revealing and establishing his true apostolic and prophetic. One of the most important ways to discern between what is real and what is false is to study intensely what is authentic, i.e. spend time with Jesus, study out diligently who Jesus is from the scriptures. And I shared on Sunday a little bit about a little revelation I had going to get some documents signed by the Justice of the Peace. And my son, as I was driving along, is dragging him along, and he asked me, what is the Justice of the Peace? And that's when the Holy Spirit dropped in my, my heart. That is what I'm calling my body to be. And so I walked in there and I experienced what we're called to be. I walked in there and right on the table there was a Bible. Do you know that they have a Bible there so that you can swear yeah. on it that you are telling the truth? No, now she didn't make me do that there and then, but she was explaining to me, we have it there as a resource. Wow. There's the word of God right there. Then she had to watch me sign these documents to make sure that I was the real deal. That I'm not imaginary. <laughs> that I'm a real person with a real signature. And that I am authentic. I'm the real person. I'm the person who's signing that document. And so God was saying, I'm calling my people to be justice of the pieces. Bring justice, bring peace. To authenticate who Jesus really is. Okay? And these are people who are learned, are proven. A justice of the peace just, just doesn't come in off the street. They have to go through a process. They have to go through training. Show themselves studied and approved, like it says in Timothy. So this is what we're doing here on Tuesday nights as we're delving into the, the depths of the Word of God to be able to authenticate this is Jesus. This is the real thing. So that's exciting, right? So how do we do that? The best way to tell between real and fake money, and you'll see this in some nations where there's a lot of there's a prolific amount of uh, counterfeit money that comes through. You know, the shop, the shop attendants will look at the money and check that it's the real deal. How do they tell that it's real? Well, they study every intricate component of the real thing. So they don't look at fakes as such. They look at the real thing. They stare at it. For hours, they look at every detail, every minute detail, every component, and they know it so well that when a fake comes their way, there's a fake. Toss that one. And that's what we're called to be as the body of Christ. Amen. This is what we're doing. We're sharpening our swords, we're sharpening our discernment to discern what is the true prophetic, what is the true apostolic, what is the true fivefold, what is Jesus. Down to the most minute detail to stare at and study it out so closely that you can spot a fake a mile away. This is what we are called to be like as Christians and leaders in the body of Christ, to be intimate with and know the person of Jesus so well that you can spot what is false. And I talked a bit on Sunday about the prodigal son from the point of view that I believe that that's not just speaking about the unsaved. I believe the prodigal son in today is talking about the church. That he was a son. He had the inheritance. He was saved. But he chose instead of staying with the Father, having relationship with the Father, intimacy with the Father, he chose the benefits. He said, give me my inheritance. I'm taking it, I'm gone. And isn't that so much of a lot of ministry I've seen? 
You want all the benefits. You want the bells and whistles and the first class travel and to be admired and famous on YouTube, have a big following, resources, big church. And then you lose track of intimacy with the Father. And you know what's the real sign that you're losing track as a leader with intimacy with the Father? A sin creeps in. You're no longer ruthless with sin in your own life. And B, you no longer reveal Jesus. If you're intimate with him, if you're close to his heart, hearing his heartbeat, all you want to talk about is Jesus revealed. Instead, self-help messages come in and worldly messages come in. And I've been to conferences, Christian conferences, and they're playing Beyonce at the end of the conference and they're having a dance party. Yeah. This is what happens when you become like the prodigal son and you want all the benefits and all the bells and whistles, but you've lost intimacy with the father. And it was at the point when the prodigal son reached rock bottom and had a realization, I'm not even worthy to be called a son. I, I'll come back and I'll be a servant. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> servant. He humbled himself. He ran. We're going to see it. I want to prophesy that over this nation. We're going to see the ones that moved away from intimacy with the Father. And we're going to see heavy conviction come again to the body of Christ. And we're going to see them run to the Father. And you know what happened? There was true authority that was bestowed. He gave him the ring. And he gave him the robe. True Father's authority. True ministry. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to pray into being. So here's some red flags of false ministry, just quickly. These are things that we've just found in day-to-day -day ministry. People that have come our way and there's a red flag. First one's really important. They won't serve. Very, very important. Uh, they, they think they're too important to do menial tasks. I remember a man coming into our midst and he, he walked with us for a while. He came to every prayer meeting, he came to meetings, and he wanted to preach. I knew that he thought and he purported himself to be an international evangelist and he would give us his resume of all the things that he'd done at this organization, that church, and how he's affirmed here and affirmed there. And then we would give him a few minutes to bring communion. And he would do that. And then we'd kind of test him again and say, hey, we just need some chairs put out. You know, at the time we were still setting up things for church. And he would just stand there and he'd just watch other people <laughs> put out chairs. And then in the end, when he saw that we weren't going to give him the pulpit, he, he came up to us and said, well, I'm just not the communion guy. <laughs> and he left. Red flag! <laughs> Anybody who's not willing to serve has something wrong in here, and that is a breeding ground for really sinister things. So won't serve. Amos 3.7 is servants, the prophets. Self and ambition. Want the benefits, the inheritance, but not willing to pay the price. Eager to and have to minister all the time. <laughs> This is really key. This is a red flag. I can see that somebody wants to do that. It's trying to make it happen. There is there's a lack of submission to God and His ways. They're pushy. They have to prophesy and they have to pray over someone. False teaching and bad doctrine. They preach another Jesus. We find 2 Corinthians 11.4. They're not fathers and mothers who lay down their life and give their lives to raise up sons and daughters. That's another red flag. You can have itinerant ministry, but are you bringing others along, teaching them how to do it? Even evangelists 
Ephesians says, are called to mature the body of Christ. And so you're not just called to lead people to Jesus, you're called to mature the body of Christ to do so as well. So if you're not doing that, you're either immature or you've got some motives perhaps that are not completely godly. So fathers and mothers who lay down their life and raise sons and daughters, and this is an obvious one I know, but I can tell you it's overlooked many a time. Lack of character. And you'll find there'll be little things, little foxes, that'll grow into bigger things. Little foxes that maybe they're constantly late. They don't keep their word. And you think, oh, that's a little thing. I'll just overlook it. But they keep doing that and then that opens the door to other stuff. And so we've seen the telltale signs. So we want to discern the authentic. Amen. So discerning what is real. And I want to um, relate back to what we were talking about with David and Saul. You know, there's a David heart that's been released in our midst here as a, as a grace on this fellowship. Do you know yes. about lack of character though? Sometimes it's yes. hard for the Christians to see that because they're only coming across the pastor on a weekend, like you know, one or two hours. Yes. There's probably more of those around the ministry team that on a daily basis where they've said something and they don't you find that. Yes. It's hard for the Christians to see sometimes false. Yes, yes, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, about accountability. And, and that's yeah, important, especially for leadership. Exactly right, yeah. Um, it is imperative as God's church that we discern between what is false and real. The truth is when the body of Christ chooses to install or come under a Saul-like, man-centered leader, they are actually rejecting God. Rejecting God. So unsanctified man will always want their king Saul. And I'm going to show you this in scripture. 1 Samuel 8, verse 10 to 20. Let's just turn there quickly. Samuel 8. <coughs> so 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 20. Somebody can read that out for me. 1 Samuel 8. All the words of the Lord to the people who had asked him and asked of him a king. He said, This will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them with himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. How far are we? To 20. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his ploughing and to reap his harvest, and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. As the word is being preached and spoken out, that's prophetic. <laughs> yes. Amen. Sorry, keep going. Yeah. He will also take his orders for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the rest of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you, you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not, eat, will not answer you in that day. Mm. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but there shall be a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go there for go out before us and fight our battles. Yes. What version was that, Lucy? That's a good version. I like that. <laughs> awesome. But isn't that so much like a lot of the church at large? You know, in verse 19 it says, 
No, we want a king over us. We want to be like all the other nations with a king. We want to be like that big chain of churches. We want to be like that flavor. We want the same kind of leadership. And Saul was the king the people wanted. And I want to make this point that God, I believe begrudgingly, in a holy way, gave them what they wanted, but it wasn't his will. And he can give you what you want, but it's not his best. And you will suffer the consequences here. Samuel is explicit. He's going to live for self. He's going to take advantage of you. He's going to cause suffering in your life. And what happened? They said, we still want him. Can you imagine that? He says, this king you so much want for yourselves. That's the key. They wanted something from their point of view, but they never asked God what he wanted. God wanted a man after his own heart. Yes. A man willing to go through process. A man willing to go through obscurity. A man with the right motives. And 1 Samuel 10, 19 says, because they chose Saul, and this is really important, especially in these last days, but you have now rejected. Everyone say rejected. rejected. That's a strong word. This is the voice of the Lord. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So in effect, to choose a Saul-like leader, to come under that, to install him and to glorify that leader is actually rejecting God. That's the honest truth. So that's why we have to be so careful to be justices of the peace. This is Jesus. I'm following that. I'm following him. Amen. 1 Kings 8.16, you can go there in your own studies, but it talks about Solomon building the temple. And you can, I encourage you to read the whole account because it's the apostolic being played out. You know, Solomon was selected to build the temple. And in that, he, the Lord calls it the temple where his name will dwell. That's important. What is his name? His name is who he is. And so if the church isn't revealing who Jesus is, it's not doing his job. That is his, the church's whole purpose. That is what we exist to do. And so any church that's revealing a Jesus other than the true gospel is in a dangerous place. That's the honest truth. So we have to be so careful. The place where his name dwells. So I want to move into the depths of God's Word. We're going to go deep tonight on the aspect of the body of Christ, but through the anatomy of the body. And I love talking about this teaching. And I'm, I'm believing that as we uh, expound on this, that God's going to give you more revelation, more layers of things throughout the week and it's going to spark off something. It might be something that you dreamt, something that God gave you in a prophetic word, something that you read in the word that's just going to spark and wow, that's what that means. The secrets of the Lord are revealed to those who fear Him. Amen. So I'm excited about that. To grasp a more deeply revelatory and insightful understanding of how the body of Christ is meant to work, we look to the anatomy of the body, and I love that um, I can teach this all over the world. That everybody has a body, <laughs> and so God speaks to us in ways that we can understand. It's international. It's a it's a concept that anybody hopefully can easily understand. God has showed us His perfect plan for His church through creation, our body. This teaching will provide insight to help you work with God to build his house. Identify and understand better the parts of the body of Christ and how they are meant to function and to interact. And as leaders, it will also assist us in helping mentor people into their callings and prevent them from being misunderstood. 
So we need to receive the true apostolic and prophetic. Amen. Because a lot of the time it's rejected. And I remember, I'm sure Chris won't mind me sharing this, but I remember we were in a church meeting once and um, there was a, a, a prophet ministering and he picked Chris right out of the crowd, as they often do, and he started prophesying over him. And he said, I just see you as, you know those things that are on the dock, you know, when there's a jetty and there's a dock, and it's called like a stalwart. You know those, those poles that go right down deep into the depths of the ocean, and they're solid and they're established? And he said, you are God's stalwart. You are immovable. You are solid. And if you know Chris, that's his personality. He's like this, you know, as a pilot, you, you can't be like this. <laughs> Something goes wrong, it's like, ah! you know, you're not able to do that. You have to have an even keel personality, don't you? You have to be good under pressure. A stalwart, S-T-A-L-W-A-R-T. And so that was, I knew, wow. You're insightful, you hear from God. That was, you know, that's Chris to a T. And then he went on to say, and you know, this stalwart, I just see this, there's like a pointy end to it. And he said, there's apostolic on you. Because the apostolic can be a bit pointy. <laughs> it can be in your face. And we need to be open to that. That's a true apostolic. They will bring a word that cuts, but brings freedom. And you know the great thing about a stalwart? All the boats moor themselves on this mooring to keep established, to stay put, to not drift away into something that's not good. Right? So that's the apostolic. We need to be able to receive that. And so we want to look into the scriptures on the body of Christ. I want to lay a foundation here. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31. And maybe we can do our one verse each going round. Maybe, Andrew, if you can start. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, which is quite prophetic. 12, 12, apostolic. <laughs> Good way to remember where scripture is. First Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members are of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptised into one body by one spirit, and we will all share the same spirit. Verse 14, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. It is therefore not of the body. If a whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If a whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? <laughs> but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they are all one, then they are we would the body be. As to this, there are many parts of one body. Then I cannot say to the head, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather. Those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Yes. Well, those parts of the body which are considered rather noble are the very parts which we got which invest the additional honour on our assembly. Sorry, our assembly parts and those suitable for its project will be treated with Seamless. Mm. But the presentation of parts have no meaning, but God and God's body have given greater honour to the part which lies on. So that there should be no division or discord or lack of adaption 
of the parts of the body to each other, but the members all alike should have a mutual interest and care for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Amen. <laughs> yes. It's 27. Now you are the body of Christ and the best you can do. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts and healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do all have, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all, do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show unto you a more excellent way. Awesome. Excellent. So we are the body of Christ. So that's explicit in Scripture, right? And a couple of points to, to kind of tease out of there. There are some parts that are seen, presentable, and some parts that are unseen. And so the unseen ones, it's, uh, it's saying, need honour too. And that's why on Sunday I really felt from the Lord that we need to honour those who do things behind the scenes. Because it is seen in heaven. And it is highly, highly honoured. Serving is highly, highly honoured in heaven. I remember um, somebody giving an account in one of our meetings. That giving is highly honoured. There was an account of they saw an angel next to the tithing offering box. Wow. And the, the angel's writing down wow. how much everyone was putting in. <laughs> Makes you want to put in more, doesn't it? But it's, it was accounted in heaven. Wow. So I want to tell you that a lot of what is unseen mm. is seen mm. and recorded yeah. and known. Yeah. And there is a reward in heaven. Okay. So I love that about the body of Christ and that there are so many different parts and, and we need to work together. We can't be jealous of one another. Why can't I be that or this? So that's what we want to build a culture of. We want to affirm people and what they're called to be and then put them in positions where they can move in the grace that God's given them. And I, that's what I love about the prophetic. A lot of what I see and prophesy over people is their calling. Probably 80-90% of personal prophecy that I've given to people has been about the calling of God on their life. God is really, really interested in you knowing that. And, you know, the prophetic, the prophets are the generals. They see where the soldiers are meant to be and put them in formation so that they can march together in their strength and take out the enemy. So this is what we're God is preparing us. He's preparing us for the move of God that is to come. So do you know your calling? Have you made it clear? It says to make a calling and election. Sure. Let's um, go to Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. I'll just read this one out. Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. Verse 7. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ gave himself, gave the apostles, they are a gift, believe it or not. <laughs> Hopefully you want it. <laughs> Some churches don't want the real apostolic, but we do. Amen? Yes, amen. amen. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers 
to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to read on. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head. That is Christ. From Him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work awesome passage so it talks first about the fivefold why are the fivefold there is it to get worldwide international ministry <laughs> to be known no why are the fivefold there until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the son of god and become mature mm -hmm. so if anybody who purports to be the fivefold isn't doing that then i question whether you are so they are called to call us to maturity bring us into maturity so that we'll no longer be infants so we'll no longer be tossed around by false teaching but we'll be able to discern what is Jesus yeah. that's maturity we will in all things grow up into him who is the head Christ from him the whole body is joined they make sure that you are joined to Jesus all they talk about Jesus all the time yeah. who is Jesus <laughs> that's the mark of the fivefold. This is the true leadership of God. And next week we're going to look into the evangelist, the pastor, the shepherd's heart, the true shepherds, what they look like. Because there are false ones. And they're prolific. It's clear in the Word of God. So prophets are symbolized, and we're going to talk about the prophets and the apostles. So I want you to write down Isaiah 29:10, because it's not in your notes. But I'll read it to you. Isaiah 29.10 The Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes. Everyone touch their eyes. He has sealed your eyes. The prophets. It's explicit here. He has covered your heads. The seers. So, prophets are symbolized by the facial features in the Bible. The eyes. The mouth the nose, the ears. So when you read in Scripture, Scripture is like a diamond. It has a literal meaning, and then there's depths. Just like the Lord Jesus, <laughs> there's depths to knowing Him. There's layers. And so when you read about the eyes, you can look at it from the point of view that the eyes are also the prophets. And we are called to be a prophetic people too. Amen. And I'm going to show you how that plays out in Scripture. So these facial features are close. They're found on the head. Who's the head? Jesus. Jesus. So you'll find them always seeking Him, always in prayer, always in the secret place, close to Jesus. And what does the facial feature reveal it reveals what you look like so the true prophetic should reveal what Jesus looks like yeah and I want to make a point so can I get a volunteer maybe Lucy oh yeah Ray <laughs> Lucy or Ray either one yeah Lucy awesome so I'm going to play out a little drama <laughs> so um, I want you to tell me about your day how was your day today oh, it was busy yes it was hectic it was unexpected yes and then there was peace amongst it yes mm -hmm. and there was successes yes and then there was a time okay yeah but it was Good. work that's work. That's a day at work for me. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Now ask me about my day. How was your day? Um, 
Well, my day was, yeah, it was a good day and, you know, I did some mummy things and I got the kids to school and, um, yeah, and then it was a bit busy and I was preparing for the Word and then seeking God and putting dinner together and that's just about my day. <laughs> Did anyone find that strange? <laughs> what was I? Yeah. What was I doing? What was I doing? Looking elsewhere. I was looking maybe at her feet. But when you talk to someone, you look at their eyes. Eyes, right? Awesome. Thanks, Lucy. <laughs> Give her a clap. Yay! Good drama outplay. Thanks for that. So when we relate to someone, we look at their eyes, right? And there's a saying, the eyes are the window to the soul. You look at the eyes to see their emotion. Yeah. You know, yeah, their expression. Yeah. Like, if they're talking to you about the funeral that they went to that day, oh, it was so sad. <laughs> and I cried and people, yeah. You know, it doesn't match what they're saying. <laughs> and you think, that's strange, because you're reading their expression. That's part of communication and in fact we learn it at university and in, in marketing theory that communication is 90 percent body language and I want to encourage you that's a picture of the body of Christ and the prophetic the prophetic brings the communication of God to the body and it's all about communication hearing from God and then communicating him to the body. And so the eyes, the eyes are also the beauty of the face. You know, as a woman, you know, this morning I did my makeup and I love being a girl, I love doing my makeup. And the, the one area of my face that I spend the most time on, and Chris probably goes, come on, hurry up. <laughs> We're gonna go. <laughs> no, he's very patient with me. But the one area that I spend the most time on in makeup is my eyes. Like I put my highlighter on and my mascara. I do my eyebrows, hopefully by time. <laughs> because they are the beauty of the face, right? And so the prophetic, I believe that's a picture, brings the beauty of God's heart, the beauty of God's glory to the body. We need the prophetic. Amen. His glory is beautiful. The beauty of His holiness. It talks about worshipping Him in the beauty of His holiness. A lot of worshippers are prophetic. I'm called to be prophetic. Yeah. In fact, I just wanted to share, Andrew, as you were worship leading, I saw <laughs> attention. <laughs> I saw as you were worshipping, I saw you coming up to this lamp and turning it up, turning up the heat and the light was intensifying and it was like I just really sensed that God was intensifying the prophetic even more in your life because the light speaks of the revelation of Him and as you worship I saw the oil you know, sustaining that light and that there would be a pressing of the olive, you know, the oil coming out. There'd be intercession that would come on you in the season that would bring an even greater um, presence, even greater anointing as you worship. So the lamp, the lamp stand, you know, is a picture of the church. Amen. So, awesome. So prophets are symbolized by the facial features and there's so much to this I don't have time to go through it all because I want to cover the, prof, uh, the apostle quickly as well. But they're also positioned close to the glory. Do you know the hair represents the glory? No, 1 Corinthians 11.15 says the glory of a woman is her, is her hair. The beauty. Right? I spend a lot of time on my hair. <laughs> too. I'll just admit it. But it's the glory of the woman, right? So I'm tending the glory. I'm being prophetic. <laughs> That's what I tell my husband. <laughs> I'm just tending the glory, darling. Give me a few minutes. <laughs> or else you'll regret it. <laughs> also. 
awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me turn this around. We're going to get a bit technical. Not too technical. Are there any medical professionals here? No? <coughs> Nobody's studied? Good. So you'll take what I say. <laughs> and you'll believe it. Awesome. Great. It will be on YouTube. Yeah, any comments on YouTube, I welcome. Um, the eye. So the prophet is the eye, right? So I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the eye and how significant it is. So there are different parts of the eye here. We've got the cornea. Now I won't make you touch it because it'll be... <laughs> That's the other area of the eyes. The eyes are very sensitive, aren't they? And you, I mean, you imagine having an accident where something hits you in the eye. Oh, yeah. Whoa. You know, you're mowing the lawn and you come across a few stones and it hits you in the eye. <laughs> That hurts. Even more so if it hit you somewhere else, right? There is a sensitivity to the eye. And we need to understand yeah. that about, if you're going to be a leader, you need to understand that about prophetic people. <laughs> that there's a sensitivity. They feel things. <laughs> they sense things. Sometimes that others may not. And it may be a little strange. <laughs> but it's part of what they're called to do, called to be. So here we have a cornea, and then we have an optic nerve, okay? So, which extends out from the lens. Okay, so the lens is quite significant because the light comes in here and hits, okay? And here's a little quiz. Does anybody know what this is that the light comes through. Good! The pupil! We are all pupils, by the way. <laughs> That's prophetic too. But you are a pupil as a student, but also you are a pupil as in part of the eye. And you know, the Word of God talks about David in the Psalms being like the apple of his eye. And the other definition of that in some versions, the apple of his eye, is the pupil of his eye. So this is you. Pupil. What does the pupil do? It takes in the light, it focuses it, and it becomes bigger when it's dark, it becomes smaller when it's light. That's significant. You remember John the Baptist, the prophet? preparing the way for Jesus. Before he came, there was lots of darkness and he had, to, he had to speak it out. He had to get big and say, you know, pay your taxes, you know, do the right thing. But when Jesus came, when light came, he became, he must increase, I must decrease. Wow, interesting, hey? Pupil of the eye. And what happens? It focuses the light onto this. Does anybody know what that is? Starts with C. Oh no, it doesn't start with C. It starts with R. Retina. 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 That's it. Retina. Excellent. So the retina perceives and processes the light. It's the inner coat of the eye, which is a light sensitive layer of tissue. And light striking the retina initiates a cascade of chemical and electrical events that ultimately trigger nerve impulses. These are sent to various visual centers of the brain through the fibers of the optic nerve. So that's how we see. So this is the kicker. Do you know when a baby is formed? the invertebrate embryonic development stage, the retina and optic nerve originate as one of the first things that are formed. As outgrowths of the developing brain itself. So I really believe this shows that the prophetic is so important right from the beginning stages of the church beginning, starting, being planted. You need revelation of Jesus. 
you need to see. You need strategy from heaven. You need download. You need the retina. You need the pupil. You need the optic nerve. You need the prophets. You need the intercessors. One of the first things to form is a retina which is considered actually part of the central nervous system and is actually brain tissue. So the brain is Jesus himself, right? He is the one who directs everything. So they have to be so like Jesus, they're actually part of the brain tissue. So it's in week four that the optic nerve in pregnancy begins to form from developing brain tissue and then week eight the retina begins to form a layer of cells at the back of the eye that perceives and processes the light. Wow. The prophetic is important. The prophets are important. And apostles, I want to sh talk about the interaction of apostles and prophets. Apostles are symbolized by the hand. Everyone show me your hand. Awesome. Now the hand gets things done. Okay, the prophetic sees, brings light. The hand gets things done. They have supernatural ability to do. Supernatural ability to do. So here's a powerhouse concept. The apostolic and prophetic must work together to fulfill God's best in his ordained house. You've heard the term eye-hand coordination? Yes. Have you ever tried to eat a meal blindfolded and your hands behind your back? <laughs> it's going to be messy. Eye-hand coordination, right? This is how the body is meant to work. So the prophet receives insight, strategy on how to build, and the apostle begins to build and begins to put structure. This is how we're going to run it. This is how it's going to be built on this level, this level. And so prophets are apostolic, apostles are prophetic, so they move in those graces as well together. But there is a central grace usually that's on someone and they have to work together and see the problem with the body of Christ is that a lot of the time you'll find that a church starts up because maybe an evangelist has arisen and or a pastor has arisen and is really good with people and people love them and they they're really you know charismatic and they're good people skill people and they gather people naturally and they might be a pastor they might be an evangelist heading the church and that's part of yeah they're part of the leadership team but without the prophet and the apostle the prophetic and the apostolic it's like the body is maimed yeah yeah so you're walking around disabled maimed and that's why we're not seeing the body of Christ come to its fullness and the Lord Jesus said, on this rock up will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the calling of the church. Why aren't we seeing that? Because we aren't releasing and allowing the prophets and apostles, I believe, to be founded in the church and to be the eyes and the hands. And we are prophetic. We are apostolic. So that outplays in our life. So with the eyes and the hands in place, working together, supernatural ability is released. Here's something else prophetic. Between the head, the facial features, and the hand is the shoulder. Shoulder speaks of authority. You know, in Isaiah 9, 6, it says the government, speaking of Jesus, will be on his shoulders. So God is speaking about the line of authority. We just read first apostles, second prophets. There is a line of authority that flows in the body of Christ. And how do the prophet and the apostle work together? And this is my favorite illustration, outworking of how the prophet and the apostle work. Uh, John 13, 21 to 25. I'll quickly read it out for the recording. This is speaking of Peter. Peter is 
picture of the apostle. And John. John is a picture of New Testament prophet. You know, he he wrote Revelation, so I think he's got a prophetic grace on his life somehow. <laughs> so yes, he passed the grade. Well, well put. So John 13, verse 21 to 25. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, "Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me." Jesus speaks out something cryptic, something puzzling. What? Somebody's going to betray you amongst us? And this is so beautiful. I love what plays out after this. In verse 22, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John. Isn't that a beautiful description? He describes himself as the disciple yeah. whom Jesus loved. He had a secure knowledge of who he was. He was loved. That's a secret to the prophetic too, isn't it? So one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, or in some versions it says, resting in, the, in his bosom, hearing his heart. That's where you'll find prophets. Always close to his heart, hearing his very heartbeat. And then verse 24, Simon Peter, the apostle, motioned to this disciple and said, um, Ask him what he means. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, the apostle, Simon Peter, so you know, close to Jesus, but he saw the grace on John the prophet's life, who was there constantly hearing the, the heartbeat of Jesus. And what does he mean? Because <laughs> you know more than I, I do, I think, because you're the prophet. <laughs> so you see this beautiful interplay between the apostolic and the prophetic and so the apostle says we need to hear from god prophets prophesy tell me what is on god's heart today and then i can run church i can do what god wants so isn't that a beautiful way that we see the apostolic and the prophetic work together now prophets are also the ears right I want to talk to you about how it's interesting we have two eyes, two ears, right? What happens when we just have one eye? We don't have as much focus with the ears, yes, lose balance, don't as ha have as much perception, don't have as much depth of sight. Myopic. Oh, that's a technical term. So is that short-sighted? Short-sighted? Short Long-sighted? Last week we had a word about glasses. So <laughs> maybe it's quite prophetic about the eyes. But for instance, if you want to go get your driver's license and you only have one eye that is functioning, it's going to be very hard for you to get your driver's license because you don't have the depth of feel, the depth of sight. Right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. The depth of sight. And so I believe that speaks of accountability. Two ears, two eyes. You know, in Corinthians it says, you know, in the modern day church, New Testament church, let one prophet speak, then another one judge. And we need the prophets to be in the church and to be accountable yeah. Yeah. to one another. Yes. In, and it's of benefit to you because it gives deeper insight to the body of Christ. Right? So that's, that's the prophetic picture. Yes, causes pain. Causes headaches if you don't... If you don't have sight in both eyes. Yeah, it's not operating. The body isn't operating in its fullness. So Revelation 19, 11 to 16 talks about the eyes being flames of fire. Jesus' eyes, flames of fire. Is that not a description of the prophetic? <laughs> you know, in the Psalms it says the servants are flames of fire. And then it talks about the sword coming out of his mouth. Jesus' mouth. That's a picture of the prophetic. The mouth speaking the sword, the word of God. What else about the mouth and the nose? The mouth and the nose brings in... Everyone take a deep breath. And then breathe out. Breath. 
which is vital <laughs> a little bit yeah. for the body, right? If you're not breathing, you're not living, you're dead. In Ezekiel 37, he breathed on the dry bones, they came to life. The breath speaks of the Spirit of God. So part of the prophetic function is to release and bring the presence, the Spirit of God. That's why a lot of the time when you hear a prophet prophesying, you'll sense the glory, you'll sense the presence. And when they're preaching, they're releasing the breath. And in worship, you know, I don't have time to go into the whole prophetic nature of singing, but I do singing workshops from a prophetic point of view. And it's actually a prophetic act to release breath. And the Holy Spirit began to teach me how to make a sound that was full and release the breath of God as a prophetic act to release in that room presence. The first in the natural, in obedience, so the spiritual. So the breath and the word of God is God breathed. Brings life. So the prophetic is really important. Brings life to the body, brings nutrients, but it also expels unwanted things. Right? Demonic. He is the prince of the power of the air, the enemy. So make sure that those things are expelled. <laughs> so here's some key verses. Second Chronicles 7, 14 to 16. And I believe that, wow, this is going to shed a new light on these really well-known passages. Mm. And you know this one. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Hallelujah. Now, let's read on, my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. God is speaking. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. My eyes and my heart. We're going to talk about the heart next week. I'm going to keep you in suspense. <laughs> Anyone who can guess what the heart is next week, I'll give you a lolly. <laughs> so pray and ask for revelation. Ask God. But the eyes must be there. The eyes must be in the house. And if they are, this happens. People will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from a move of God. They're always talking about that. The prophet. Psalm 17, 8, keep me as the apple, the pupil of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. We talked about that. Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes, this is really interesting, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing from now on, you will be at war in that scripture. But the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. There is a calling on the prophets to go places. There is. And even in the trip that we're taking in a couple of weeks, God has already given us a, a download of some things that we, He has us to do there, to pray there. Do you know, we've just seen an act of terrorism in the UK. And uh, we're passing through London. We know there's some things that He has us to pray for. Hallelujah. We've just got another people. It's great. <laughs> We're increasing. Yay. Awesome. Hi. Um, Matthew 6, 22 to 24. Just quickly. Matthew 6, 22 to 24. And I think this will be interesting for you to look at this from the point of view as the eyes of the prophets. Matthew 6, 22 to 24. This is giving us an insight into what, how the prophetic functions and how it's supposed to operate in the body. So verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, the prophets are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Hallelujah. Full of the revelation of Jesus. Full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, 
Your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So it's really interesting, isn't it? Looking at it from the point of view that the eyes are the gateways to the body. If the eyes are good, if the eyes are doing their job, if they're revealing Jesus, then the body will be full of light. We follow the revelation of who Jesus is. Walking in truth, walking in victory. But if the eyes aren't good, darkness. Yeah. On, on the way here, I was actually listening to the um, radio, and there's this guy who's developed this thing that um, those who like, lost their sight, um, like a camera yes. that can recognise words and actually tell the person what the words were. And the lady that they gave it to, she said she only had 1% light eyesight, so she couldn't even recognise her own children. Oh, and wow. She's got the glasses, she's got her side back. She wow. can now recognise wow. things. So it's in, yes. you lose your eyesight, you lose uh, your wife. Yeah, and what joy. Yeah. Oh. And that's the same joy I believe we need to have when we see the true prophetic come mm. into operation and bring the light. Yes. The prophets must take their place in the body of Christ. The prophets, the um, eyes are like the gateways, the gatekeepers, the doorkeepers in the house of the Lord that let light in. The revelation of Jesus, keep darkness out. If the prophets or prophetic people in the house are compromised or false, they let darkness in. They're not doing their job and the whole body will be dark. And this can happen. You know, there were 400 prophets of Baal and one prophet Elijah would stand up and say, this is God. Wow. Also the ears, Narelle mentioned of the they bring balance. Right? Balance and equilibrium help us stay upright when standing and knowing uh, standing and know where we are in relation to gravity. So our balance system helps us to walk, run, move without falling. Anybody ever had vertigo or know someone with vertigo? That's what happens when that is that a whack? You can't do anything. It paralyzes the whole body, right? This is how important the prophetic needs to be installed in the body of Christ. They bring balance. What does that mean? This balance system allows you to know whether you're upright or not. Balance also speaks of wisdom. Good judgment. This is on the prophetic. So interesting, isn't it? I want to talk quickly about intercessors before I finish. And there's some scriptures there about apostles and the hand. And the finger of God talks about an axe, the finger of God. Acts 4.30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. It speaks about the power that comes with the apostolic, the supernatural power and authority that is on the apostolic mantle. But intercessors also is part of the prophetic family. And I don't think that they're talked about enough. Intercessors. Intercessors come under the family of the prophet. They are highly prophetic. It's a high calling which is often unseen, which needs to be highly honoured, <laughs> and known in heaven. They are symbolised by the inner parts. So they are unseen. And you can operate in different parts of the body. I believe there are prophetic pastors. I believe there are pastoral prophets. I believe there are apostolic evangelists. So the Lord Jesus operated in all five, right? Yeah. And so in effect, your calling is the same as mine. We're all called to be like Jesus. And so he was the prophet, the apostle, the teacher, the pastor, the evangelist, right? But there is a grace and a path I believe he brings each one of us so that we can work together to bring the whole revelation of Jesus. And so the intercessor is symbolized by the inner parts. And so I talked a bit on Sunday about the valley of dry bones. The bones speak of the intercessors 
coming together. That's why we're praying towards prayer gatherings, just to seek God, gather the intercessors, gather the prayer warriors, gather those willing to pray. That has to come together before the body arises as the army, the true army of God. Speaking of the intercessors, Habakkuk 3.16. Anybody find Habakkuk? Habakkuk 3.16. might have to go to to the beginning to look it up. Yes, after Nahum. After Nahum. Habakkuk 316. Yes. And to my bones. In some versions, says the bones trembled. Wow. Sometimes there'll be things that happen to an intercessor that are a little bit out there. <laughs> but he's, it talks about the bones trembling. Yeah. Yeah. 1 Peter 1.13 talks about the loins of the mind, the procreative. That's all inter the intercessor, spiritual birthing. There have been times of intercession. I've gone into intercession and I've felt like I'm birthing something in the spirit. And God will show me this is the spirit of what he's birthing in this fellowship, in this season. So that procreative, it's bringing life. It's birthing something in the spirit. That's all part of the symbol of the procreative inner parts. The loins of the mind. Birthing in the spirit. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Psalm 51.6. Hallelujah. Now, as an appendix, I put some things in there that uh, answer some questions from last week that uh, were asked about the difference between the prophetic and the office of the prophet. So I encourage you to read through that. And also, there's also an appendix there on the test of the maturity of prophetic ministry, which is really, really key. That's, a, um, that's from Mike Bickle's book, Growing in the Prophetic, which is an awesome text on pastoring the prophetic in church. So if you have any questions about that in the break, I'm happy to, to chat with you about that. But thank you, Father. We just thank you for your word. Seal it in our hearts. And uh, as we break, Lord, I pray that your presence would be sweet and the fellowship would be sweet as well, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.